Heritage Words, a podcast about how we engage with our ancestral languages in new and creative ways. Heritage Words is produced by the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, which raises awareness about Jewish ancestral diversity through the lens of language. I'm your host, Sarah Bunin Benor. Today we're speaking to Sarah Sassoon, whose ancestral languages include Baghdadi Judeo-Arabic. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me, Sarah. I'll be asking you about your ancestors, your connection to Judeo-Arabic, and the books you've written. But first, let's get to know you a little bit. Tell us where did you grow up and where do you live now? Okay, so I grew up in Sydney, Australia. Um, when I was 20, I got married and moved to South Africa, so my accent's a bit mixed up. And I now live in Jerusalem in Israel with my husband and four boys. And how old are your boys? So my oldest is 20. Um, then I have an 18 year old, a 16 year old and an 11 year old. Nice. And did they were they all born in Israel? So they were born in South Africa. And um, my oldest was 11 when we came to Israel. And my youngest was three. So they've spent most of their lives now in Israel. Oh, okay. So tell us a little bit about your ancestors. Where were they from? And when did your family arrive in Australia? So my father's, um, all my paternal and maternal grandparents are from Iraq. My father was born in Baghdad. Um, so they claim ancestry all the way back to the Judean exiles who were exiled to Babylonia in 586 BCE with Nebuchadnezzar. So um, they're Babylonian Jews, um, which is the ancestry of Iraqi Jews. So Iraqi Jews actually in Hebrew call themselves um, Yehudei Bavli. Um, which is the most accurate way to call them. So I know there's a whole discussion at Jews from Iraq, Arab Jews, and the truth is they're not Arab, they're Babylonian because they were there before the Arabs arrived, um, before the Islamic conquest of the seventh century. So um, my grandmother's actually from al which is a village in the south of Iraq, which is where Ezra the scribe is buried and her father was the custodian there. So their roots go very, very deeply um, with the biblical history of the Jews in Babylonia. Um, and then in 1951, they came to Israel um, with the expulsion of the Jews from Iraq. It's a long historical story. And um, it was the Operation Ezra and Nehemia where over 120,000 Jews left Iraq for their safety to Israel. And all my grandparents and my father and my uncles and aunts were part of that. And they landed in the refugee camps in Israel. Um, my father's grandparents, my father and his parents and his family, they were in the Mabara of Pardes Chana. So Mabara is the word for immigrant, um, it's called transit camp, camp. But really these transit camps, I mean, people were there for like over 10 years, some people. Um, they weren't there for that long, they were there for a year. Um, and then they moved to Zichron Yaakov and they built up lives in Israel. However, um, after 16 years, they decided to move to Australia where my grandmother had a sister because her sister came to Israel and said, why are you living like this? <laughs> Life in Israel was really hard. Um, I mean, 1951, it was the Tzena period of the depression period. There really wasn't food. There was no housing, um, no jobs. And they built up their lives, but it was very basic. Um, anyone who's been to Israel, like even in the 80s, Israel was really basic. You were lucky to find a coffee shop. Um, things are very different here now, obviously. So they all moved to Australia. Um, my uncles by then were grown. My dad finished the army and also moved to Sydney. Um, there were eight siblings. My grandmother came to Israel, five kids, and had another three kids in Israel. And um, they arrived in Australia in the late 60s and started their lives there. And they went into business and um, my dad um, studied law. He worked very hard on his English and uh, um, achieved a law degree and began business. And he used to go to Israel every year to visit his family there. He had, they had cousins and lots of 
day of their lives were there still in, in many ways. And he met my mom and they got married and they moved and she moved to Sydney and I was born there. Wow. So your family is really transnational. You've moved back and forth multiple times. What about today? So you ended up in Israel and is uh, the rest of your family also in Israel now? So my parents are still in Sydney and some siblings. I do have a sister and brother living in Israel now. So we moved here nine years ago and a year after I arrived, my brother and his wife and kids came to Israel as well. And last year, my sister got married to an Israeli, also Iraqi, and they moved, um, she moved here to be with him. Okay, so tell us about your ancestral language. Uh, what first, what name do you use for it? Uh, well, I say Judeo-Arabic. Um, I know some Iraqis call it, in Israel they call it Iraqit. Um, uh, yeah. So I, yeah. And do you know, uh, so how much of the, of Judeo-Arabic did you learn from your parents, your grandparents, etc.? So it's so interesting. They all spoke Judeo-Arabic and even I was speaking to my aunt yesterday and she was saying that my maternal grandmother only knew Judeo-Arabic, even when she came to Israel and um, she never learned Hebrew properly. So um, Judeo-Arabic was all around me when I was growing up, but I didn't really pick it up very much. I only picked up, uh, it's very familiar to me, but I didn't pick it up. So my parents speak it, my grandparents, but me and my siblings, we don't really, we, we can't speak it and we don't really understand it properly. We understand expressions and it's, it sounds very familiar. Like even if I hear Arabic, when I walk into the old city and I'm hearing Arabic around me here in Jerusalem, it feels like home. So it is a very familiar language. It's not, um, it's not a jarring language for me. It's the, it's a mother tongue. So you associate it with home, with your family, um, do you associate it with particular relatives of yours? So I especially associate it with my father's mother, my grand, my maternal grandmother, um, because I was very close to her. And she used to speak a mix of Judeo-Arabic, Hebrew, and Pidgin English. Like her English wasn't very good. Um, she didn't have the opportunity of really interacting with um, the Australian environment very much because she was illiterate and she was a woman, a very Middle Eastern woman who cooked in the kitchen all day. Her whole domain was the kitchen and the home. And so her language reflected that. And so, yeah, I was very, very close to her and yet we didn't really have whole conversations. So did you speak to her all in English? So I spoke to her in English and Hebrew, whatever Hebrew I picked up. My Hebrew was stronger than, um, my Judeo-Arabic, mm -hmm. and um, I would just feel my way through the language. And when she'd speak in Judeo-Arabic, I'd feel my way through it. Mm. Well, you probably picked up more than you think just from those interactions, right? It's true, it's true. Um, the more I'm starting to study Judeo-Arabic now properly, the more I'm realizing, oh, I know this word, and this word brings back a memory. And it's, it's really special because relearning the language now is bringing back my childhood and bringing back my relationship with her. Mm. Wow, that's beautiful. And tell us how you're learning the language. So through uh, the Jewish languages, um, your project, the Heirloom Project, I began uh, meeting with my neighbor down the road here, who's an Iraqi Jewish woman who's from Mosul and came to Israel also in 1951. And I meet with her and we discuss Judeo-Arabic and I learn her story as a woman. Um, as a little girl growing up in Mosul, her mother's story, her grandmother's story. And while I'm better at collecting stories than Judeo-Arabic words, I am picking up more and more each time. And wow. also to the food. I'm very obsessed with food and recovering my grandmother's recipes and dishes because that again was her language. Her language was, wasn't just through through words, it was through her hands. Wow. And food was definitely a big part of that. Right, so it seems that the language for you is very much tied up with the stories, with the food. What about music? Do you, do you also- oh, Sure, I very much, I love putting on um, the Akwedi brothers, Salima Pasha. I grew up with that music around me. 
So when I put it on, I, I, I go straight back to my childhood and straight back to my grandparents' home. And even though at the time I didn't realize what I was listening to, who I was listening to, I didn't know the story of the Al-Kuwaiti brothers. I didn't know about Salima Pasha. I didn't, barely knew anything about their lives in Iraq. Um, but yet I was surrounded by the music and the food and the traditions. Wow. So even though you didn't learn the language, you probably learned some words. And so this is what I want to turn to now is the heritage words, the words that get passed down generations to people who don't fully speak that language. So can you tell us about some of the heritage words that have been passed down to you? For sure. So one of my favorite words is Ashtidak. Um, I probably don't say it correctly exactly. Um, it means um, bless your hands. And it's what you say when you've eaten a meal and you want to compliment the, the cook, the hostess. So you'd say, it's a blessing. And you'd say like, Ashtida, like bless your hands. And I just love that um, because it's, there's something so beautiful about recognizing that a meal comes from someone's hands. Um, you so, use that yourself, that word, that phrase? Um, not often. Like I married, I, my husband's South African and the truth is his grandfather is Baghdadian, but they were, he went to England. So his family's very Anglified and yeah, I, I haven't been part of that environment until I came to Israel, which is what I love about being in Jerusalem is suddenly I'm again surrounded by Iraqis and I seek them out and I get to recover the language. And like now, if I was sitting with my father's cousin at the end of the meal at his house, I, I would say Ashtida, like think like that, that's because it means something with another Iraqi mm. and it means a whole lot. It's a way of connecting on a deeper level. Like if I meet an Iraqi in Israel or anywhere in the world, I'll say Ashtida and they'll understand me and we'll have an immediate connection, which is very beautiful. And that's why I love your idea of saying these are heritage words because they very much are heritage words. Absolutely. So you would use that word in any context or specifically at a meal or at, at the end of the After, meal? At the end of a meal. Uh -huh. And so if so, can you think of times when you've used that word and people have uh, felt an immediate connection to you? Um, not really, not with the, I, I don't use the words very much. I don't. It's part of the what I'm trying to recover. I would say there's there's a broken link. The move from Iraq to Israel was a breakage of everything. And my family's further move to Australia was a further breakage because suddenly we we're in an English speaking land. You wanted to be Australian and Anglified. Again, another reason they didn't teach me to do Arabic or Hebrew. We only spoke English at home. So I think um, the lack of my language is also tells a deeper story. And I'm not the only one, even in Israel, I've spoken to uh, my generation of Iraqi Jews and they don't know either. It hasn't been passed down necessarily. Maybe they would use Ashtidak more in Israel. Um, it's a good question. It's something I'm, I'm also doing when I meet people my age, I ask them, how much do you know? But most mm. people don't even know about the Farhud. So um, it's, it's interesting how, how they didn't want to pass on the trauma, but in not passing on the trauma, they also didn't pass on the joy and the richness of the heritage, which is specifically Babylonian Jewish. Mm. Do you think there's a reversal to that trend right now and a desire to reclaim what's been lost? For sure, for sure. I think so, if people realize that there is a loss, um, because that's that maybe the tragedy, the biggest tragedy is sometimes you don't even realize something's been lost. But I think there is a further interest and I know it's my obsession to reclaim it as much as possible and share that. Yeah. So tell us how you are working to reclaim these words and we'll get to more of the words on your list, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing as a writer. So um, I write children's books and poetry and essays. Um, and what I do with my children's books, it, it very much touches on, um, my first one is Sean Spengel and it's about the, um, the having to leave Iraq, a little girl's journey of having to 
um, with her family leave that breakage point. And it's told very gently. So it's told through an Iraqi Bengal, which is just such a symbol of um, Iraqi females and also Middle Eastern females. I've had a lot of feedback that that Bengal is so symbolic for them. Again, another language would be through jewelry. Um, so I feel like I'm recovering just through a simple story like that so much. Um, and my second book is called This Is Not a Child and it's all about the Iraqi Jewish to be, which is our tradition for eat um, for Shabbat lunch. Again, a tradition that not many people know about, and it's recovering it and the the braveness of sharing it, even though it's different, even though it's not a challenge, this little girl brings it to a challenge competition and says it's just as valid. It's our Shabbat tradition. So again, this idea of yes, it's different, but it's just as Jewish. Um, one of the big things I'm also doing in recovering is saying a lot of the traditions are based in the Babylonian Talmud. These are old ancient traditions. And if we go back all the way to the Judean exile in the first temple period, it means that maybe, and it's a very big part of the Iraqi Jewish belief is that we are the original Jews and we hold a lot of the original traditions, which means that we're, we're holding it for everyone, for all Jews. Every Jew went through Babylonia. Every Jew, it, they, these traditions belong to them. And so it's, it's an inclusive way of looking at Iraqi Jewish tradition. It's not just, oh, this is a Middle Eastern tradition. No, this actually maybe is more original and maybe more um, what Jews used to do thousands of years ago before they fled to Spain and to Europe. So it's mm. recovering something more original for all Jews. Absolutely. And the uh, books, Shoham's Bengal and This Is Not a Cholent, do they use any words from Judeo-Arabic? So that's a big regret of mine. I didn't use words in Shoham's Bengal and I should have. I, I thought it was too weird. I just, it doesn't occur to me. And I think that's what the This Is Not a Cholent deals with is this idea of being different. And when you grow up feeling different the way I did and not owning your culture, even though I grew up with it and it was in my home, I didn't know how to bridge it to the outside world. And I think it's reflected in the children's books as well. I don't know how to bridge it. Who wants, to, even with This Is Not a Child, when it came out, I'm like, who would be interested in Iraqi Jewish tradition? Who cares about to be? No one's heard of it. Barely anyone's heard about Iraqi Jews. Um, so it's this, this, anxiety or even um, childhood shame that gets carried across, which is also something which is a pity because it shouldn't be there where there's so much to celebrate and sharing uh, what's different and sharing Judeo-Arabic words as well. Yeah, I think you're right about the shame being a big driving factor in the fact that these traditions were lost. Um, and maybe we're seeing a reversal of that now, just as we're seeing people reclaim their ancestral traditions, maybe that has to do with a decrease in the shame. Do you think that's true? Exactly, for sure. I gave a talk in LA at the Beth Jacob community on Shabbat, and I had said, it was all about finding the Iraqi Jewish voice, recovering the Iraqi Jewish voice of my grandmother, um, re recovering the female voice, these women, had so much to offer and yet they don't have much voice and this is part of my work is to try and share their world and the importance of their world the importance of the kitchen the food um to break that silence that middle eastern women often have as well um and to share the richness of that tradition and to be so proud of it and afterwards a woman came to me about my age in tears and she said she's always been so ashamed of being iraqi and my heart broke for her and it made me realize the work I'm doing is just so worth it just to speak what's in my heart and what I'm learning and researching and interviewing my neighbor Shulamit and getting her story and then sharing that. Um, there's such richness in her stories, there's such female wisdom in the stories of her mother and grandmother, um, which is lost because there's the language barrier, there's also the barrier of no one's thinking to talk to everyday people um, who are just simple, wonderful people just with reservoirs of richness of other worlds, which we have no idea about because of the breakage of because of displacement. That's totally true. And that's the case for Jewish languages throughout history. 
what's been recorded is the words of the elite, especially men. And we don't have the everyday language that women would have spoken. And so that's why I think it's so important to record everyday speech, especially by women, and also song and just the words that are uh, part of your, your family that have been passed down the generations. Absolutely. And that's why I so appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, so tell us more of the words that have been passed down the generations to you. So one of my favorite words is Ayuni. Uh, it means you are my eyes. My grandmother always used to say this. So for a boy, you'd say into Ayuni and for a girl, you'd say into Ayuni. So it's there's nothing more precious than a person's eyes. And so it's a term of endearment um, to say you are my eyes. And I feel like it always spoke to me so much that not only is it that I'm precious to her, but that I continue seeing for her in this world somehow. I don't know why I, I took it to mean that for me, but that I'll be her eyes in this world. I will carry her through this world. Mm, that's so beautiful. I, I, I recognize that word from a song by Yoni Avi Batat. Are you familiar with, with his music? I, I've heard of his music, um, but I'm not familiar. Well, he uses that word in a song where he's uh, talking about his grandmother teaching him how to cook and or cooking with him. And she calls him Ayuni in that song. Right, I have to look that up. Yeah, it's a very common word of um, endearment. Yeah. And I, the one thing I do love is um, the layers of meaning of Judeo Arabic is so beautiful. It's like very poetic. Yeah. Yeah, that's really nice. And then do you use that word with your children? No, no. <laughs> Are there any words that you use from Arabic with Judeo Arabic with your children? Not really. I'll be honest. Uh, the breakage is real. Yeah. I'll be really, really honest. The breakage. The, it's it's like deep. It's a, a deep breakage. Um, if, if these are words that you didn't hear growing up, then you wouldn't use them with your children because it it you know it it wouldn't feel as natural to you. Well, I did hear these growing up, but. They just would sound so strange. It's to, for me to say them somehow. It would they feel would, inauthentic. I yeah. I just feel like yeah. It's it's that I definitely have like one of the things that comes out in my poetry is is the whole idea of silence. How maybe silence was my first language mm. because of this breakage. Mm. Wow. And again, it's it, there's a relationship issue. There's a, I don't know. I, yeah, it's it, I've spoken to other Iraqi Jews also my age, and there's very similar experiences. Everyone's got different, but it just depends on how um, what the experiences of their parents were leaving Iraq, the grandparents, um, how it gets passed if it's proudly passed on with, but it was almost like. For example, another word I brought was badalak, um, which is a very beautiful word. My father said to me all the time, and I didn't think to say it to my boys. What and is it? it? Means, I am your kapara. I didn't know what it meant even growing up, but um, one of the things kapara. I've done is write a novel in verse about an Iraqi girl leaving, and it's it's on submission. I'd love for it to be picked up. It's just in the current climate. I don't know how many people are interested in the Middle Eastern Jewish story, because um, it's not very convenient, the narrative, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, Bedalak Anna, I put in the book because it means I am your kapara, and the whole idea is that um, I would do anything for you, I would take your place rather than you experience anything bad in your life. So it's a very Jewish word in the sense that we know what the, a kapara is, a kapara from Rosh Hashanah, um, that, that period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur where you take a chicken and it's a kapara um, for the sins of the year and the chicken dies instead of that person. So it's the whole idea of kapara. It's a complicated idea, but they used to do it in Iraq, um, kaparot with chickens. Um, so Badalak is that expression of kapara, of you. I would like, in, I would do anything for you, anything for me instead of you. And it's, it's a very, it's full of love. 
So how would that be used in a sentence within English? Um, um, like you're my Abdalak? I or, don't know, my father would say it in an Arabic sentence hmm. and he'd say it very fast. Um, <laughs> So it's that's the thing. I don't think because I didn't pick up the whole Arab sentence, I don't have the whole picture of it. I just remember Badalak. Uh huh. Well, that's not, that word is also in that same song by Yoni Avi Batat. So, right. Uh, right. And, but in in the same way, he's 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 using it in, in you know imitation of his grandmother, not as he would use it himself, but uh, something that he would hear from the older generation. Yes. Yes. We don't, I, I don't know how to use these words in my everyday speech. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's, it, there was a break. Yeah. The one word I do know how to use in my everyday speech, because it's, you don't have to use it in a sentence is like the, the, another word I brought, which is Bilmila, um, which is something my great aunt said to me when I was pregnant and I'll never forget it. My, with my first, she's like, she was all excited and she said, Bilmila, Bilmila. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I learned it means at the Brit Mila, we're going to come, we're going to celebrate your Brit Mila. And it's the, the ultimate blessing for an Iraqi Jewish woman to have a boy. And she blessed me well because I had four. So <laughs> there's a bias to have boys in the Middle East. And it's a very real thing. A girl was seen as a kind of uh, inconvenience because you'd have to pay her dowry. Um, so you, but you said you do use that word. Um, I don't because I, I can use it. Like my sister's pregnant now. I could say Bilmila, but she's actually having a girl. So <laughs> I wouldn't use it. And also it feels like it's, it's unfair because I don't have the expectation that a woman should have a boy. And that's the ultimate fulfillment as a mother. It's mm -hmm. a different, we live in a different culture. Thank God where girls are valued. So that's the thing as well. The, the words tell a cultural story. Mm, absolutely. Wow. Okay. What about foods? Are there any food words that you have, that you maintain in your family? You mentioned to beat. Uh, so, there... oh, a lot of food words. The truth is my kids know all the food words that has continued. I make them some busak. They know what it is. They're very, they love it. And what's nice for them is because we live in Israel, their friends know it. And they're actually proud of me making some basak and kuba, um, kuba selek. They, they love it that I make it because the, there's so many um, Mizrahim here that it makes them feel more accepted that they know these, these foods. And even with Ashkenazim, it's cool to have Iraqi Jewish food. So in that way, we're very accepted in Israel and in the world. It's funny how food is the bridge to people's hearts and minds. So it's something I want to break, actually. I want everyone to see that we've got rich stories as well and rich cultural um, parables and lessons and wisdoms more than just the food. The food's the way in, but within the food, there's a lot of wisdom. Can you give us an example of a parable or some other lesson that you want to share with the world? So funny, enough today I was in a poetry session and um, they, they were saying how difficult it is to, to trust um, in the current climate. And I was thinking of a parable I read in the Ben Chai, who was um, a famous Kabbalistic rabbi from Iraq. And he wrote a book called um, Laws for Women. And it was written in Judeo Arabic and it was to make um, laws and stories accessible to women to guide them. He wanted to reach the women. It's a very interesting book. It's been translated to English. So one of the, how does he start off the book? He starts the book off with a story. It's a very beautiful story. It's about, it's a Bedouin story actually. And it's all about a sheik with this mule. And the mule is a beautiful mule. And there's, um, he parades this mule through, through the villages and everyone admires the mule. And there's one man in particular who is very, enamored with the mule and so jealous and wants that mule and he'll do anything to get it. So he decides he's going to, um, he makes a plan to get the mule and he lies on the side of the road like a beggar when the sheik passes. 
And so the sheikh sees this man lying on the road and he says to him, um, he gets off the mule to help him and offer him water. And the man jumps up and steals the mule. And the sheikh shouts after him and says, you're not just stealing a mule, you're stealing mercy from the world. No one's going to stop for a man and give them water anymore because of you. And the man rides off and he hears the sheikh's words in his head and he gets home with the mule and he can't, he's not happy. He's hearing these words that he's stolen mercy from the world. And so he decides he's going to return the mule to the sheik and he takes the mule back and apologizes. He says, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to steal mercy from the world. I want people to trust when they see a beggar on the side of the road. Um, and the sheik is um, very happy that the mules returned and very happy that the man's contrite and says to him, you know, I, I appreciate you returning the mule. Not only can you have the mule, but you can also have my daughter in marriage. That's, I just had to add that because it's so Middle Eastern. Um, so yeah. the, the, the moral of the story is so strong for me that it's when we do something in this world, the repercussion isn't just the deed, it's also the, 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 the carry on effect of stealing trust that as a community, we live together. And when you break a social rule, such as pretending to um, need water and steal something, then you, you take away kindness in the world, you steal mercy in the world. And it's, it's another way of looking at our deeds. It's not just that we've done a bad thing, but maybe we're stealing good. We're stealing people from trusting and creating more good in this world. And I just think it's such a beautiful message. And I've never read a story like that in, the, in, in like fairy tales or in the Western world. Um, and that's a better one story. I think there's a lot of wisdom in the Middle East and it's something I'd love to share these stories. So do you have a, an idea of how you might want to share that story with the world? So I've actually written a children's story. Um, I've got a whole series of Middle Eastern children's stories. It's sitting with my agent. We'll see what happens. Um, and I'm hoping maybe some will pick it up and want to share these Jewish Middle Eastern children's stories, which bridge the East and West. Mm. Yeah, let's talk about the power of children's literature. So you you already have two books, you have all these books in the works. Um, what what impact have, have the first two books had so far? So I think Shams Bengals had a big impact um, in the sense that at least for the Iraqi community to see their story out in the world, I can't tell you the responses I've, I've had that there's a book about Mizrahi people and not just Iraqi people have reached out, Iranian, Syrian Jews. And I've even had an Afghanistan non-Jew reach out to me saying she loves the book because the Bengals is something she's received from her mother and something she wants to pass on to her daughter. So she went and bought the book for her children so that they have this idea of passing on Bengals. So again, I think the impact is the Middle Eastern story is when I tell it from the Jewish perspective, it's because I'm a Jew and that's what I know and have grown up with. But when you tell the personal, it becomes so much broader because I'm representing not just Jews from Iraq, I'm representing Jews from the Middle East, but I'm also representing women from the Middle East. And that's something I'm realizing the more I share my work. It's not just about my personal story, but I get to help people see that their story is important. And that even a simple bangle, a woman's item is important and can carry so much memory, um, which is what Sean's Bengal really is about. And the resilience of being a refugee, it's not just about what happens to us, but it's about how we can carry our lives forward with memory, which is also what This Is Not A Challenge is about as well. The fact that we might have to leave a place, but we carry our recipes with us and we get to share that with our communities and be proud of it, even though it makes us nervous. The little girl gets very nervous and this is not a challenge. She's like, what, what am I doing entering the to be an Iraqi Jewish dish when everyone says it's not a challenge? And her grandmother has to reassure her and say, this recipe has been passed down from generations and it's, it's very meaningful that it's here now with you in Sydney, because the story is based in, well, not in Sydney, but in Australia. It's based in Australia. It's about, again, being a refugee with your own recipes, but owning it and saying, this is who I am within that new world. Well, both of those books 
have an heirloom, something that was passed down the generations. In one, it's a bangle, a bracelet, and in the other, it's a, a, a food. And um, that's that's what we're focusing on here is, you know, our heirloom program that you participated in the, the pilot of. Um, and, it, you know, another part of the heirloom program is this podcast uh, where we're talking about heritage words and collecting heritage words in the Jewish English lexicon, because it's all about heirlooms. We think of language as yet another heirloom that's been passed down the generations. But unfortunately, so many families don't see it that way. They see, yes, I have this special bracelet that my grandmother gave me, or we have this food that's been passed, the recipe that's been passed down through the generations. But I think the same is true for language. And um, I wonder if, do, do any of your books that you're currently working on have any more uh, Arabic words in them? So I've become more conscious of Arabic words. So in the Middle Eastern stories, there are more Arabic words and I'm learning it's okay to have a glossary and it's okay. My novel and verse is full of Arabic words. Um, and I especially sought them out. I sought, how do you say wild girl in Arabic? I wanted to know what you would have called a girl who was wild in Iraq. I wanted to capture that, that feeling of the language because the truth is how do you capture a lost world without the language? Wow. Well, yeah, and it's, it's similar to um, heirlooms. You know, let's say you have uh, a bracelet that was passed down the generations, but you lost it. Then you can find another bracelet that is uh, similar, you know, similar style, but it won't have that same family connection, that same sentimental value, maybe. Um, and but I think with language, it might. Well, I don't know. Do you think it's similar with language that if you have words that you heard from your grandmother, it has more of a sentimental value than it than words that you learned later from another older person who speaks the language. Um, it's interesting. I feel like every Judeo Arabic word I learn is very precious. Um, and I make it more personal. What I'm trying to do as I'm learning it now is, is, is try and make it very, very personal and take it to my heart because I know that's the language of my grandmother and every word reminds me of her because um, there was a lot of conversation. I just didn't understand it all. So it's um, another word I had on my list is Ashlonak and that's a word I can see myself using a lot as I go forward now. It's a greeting and even as I say it, I, I hear it. I hear it thousands of greetings in my life, millions of ashlonak, ashlonak, like ashlonak, there's a way of saying it, you don't even just say ashlonak, you say ashlonak, it's a, there's a there's a whole rhythm of, of the way you say the word, and it means how are you, and I found out when I was looking up for today's session, I, I was like, okay, so what does it mean, I know it means how are you, but my aunt told me that it means literally what is your color today, and what does that mean? She said, when the Benish Chai writes about shaming someone that the, the face of the person's, um, the color of the person's face changes to kurkum, to like turmeric, to a, like a yellow color. So the, the color of our face reflects how we're feeling. And I just thought that's so beautiful. That is just such a wonderful way of asking someone, how are you? Like, what color are you today? Like, it's, it's just so beautiful. And just that alone was such a gift. Of, of knowledge and again that Ashlonak is, is like a song in my head of so many happy greetings. Mm, I love that. I think that would be a great uh, graphic to make yes. uh, of that word, maybe written in English, Hebrew letters and Arabic letters and uh, then ex maybe explain, maybe I know I guess we wouldn't explain it in the graphic, but I, I just love that. That's really beautiful. Yeah, it's uh... It's special, words are special. And I think it's just the effort of knowing them again and reclaiming them again and creating that pride again around the language. We might never recover the way they spoke to each other and could converse. I don't know if that will happen in my generation and pass on to my kids, but we can recover the richness of the language and the joy of it. And um, I hope through my poetry, and my stories, to, to recover as many words as I can and to own as many words as I can and start passing these to my children and grandchildren. Maybe with my grandchild, I will say and learn how to say that proper 
full word because the love is there. It's just the confidence isn't. Mm. Well, that's a, a phenomenon that I've heard about with regard to Yiddish. Uh, people whose grandparents spoke Yiddish and then they, when they became grandparents, they started using more Yiddish words, um, and even though they hadn't used them previously because they associated it with old people and with grandparents. And once they reached that life stage, they thought it was appropriate for them to start using that. That's, that's amazing. And in that way, maybe we will recover language generation to generation. It might just skip the one generation. Mm -hmm. a little well, bit. I, yeah, I've, I've written about this. I call it the boomerang effect, um, where the immigrant generation or the generation that loses their language for some reason or another speaks the most distinctly, and then their children speak less distinctly, but then the next generation has an uptick in their distinctive language use because of a reclamation of interest. Uh, I mean, then this is also part of a broader sociological trend that's called the third generation return. Um, right. Yeah. No, it makes complete, complete sense. It's also the third generation is a little bit less traumatized and is just trying to make sense of where they come. Like, I know I'm trying to make sense of the family I grew up in and everything that wasn't was silent and not said and uncovering the stories helps me understand what, what happened um, to my family and, and how big a displacement it was from Iraq just because they didn't speak about it didn't mean it didn't affect them. And like if I asked my dad about the Mabarot, he won't speak about it. It's like he wasn't there. That doesn't mean he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When there's trauma, it's sometimes very hard to, to speak about these things. And I think that sometimes extends to the language as well, unfortunately. Yeah. And Iraqi Jews are very silent. They really just got on with it. They're, they're not confrontational. They're not. They really just want to rebuild their lives. They didn't want to go backwards. They didn't want to face all the grief. I think it would have been too much. Mm. Well, we see some of that stigma in in your in your books. Uh, in this is not a chillant. It the girl is ashamed of her family's different chillant, right? Yeah. And and so it you're you're representing that in literature, but you're also trying to overcome it. Right. Exactly. I, I am, and it's with adults um, literature. I can go deeper into it even and explore it more head on in my poetry. I think I speak about it more and I recover the stories even more there. Speak mm. about the difficult, like what would have caused the, the Iraqi Jews to leave Iraq in the first place, um, incidents such as the Farhood um, pogrom in 1941, uh, the, the buildup of anti-Semitism, and then also the reality of the immigrant camps in Israel, the reality of not being able to speak Arabic in Israel, um, just like European Jews weren't encouraged to speak Yiddish, the Arabic, the Arabic speaking Jews were also told do not speak Arabic here. They were ashamed to speak it on the streets, only at home. They'd speak. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a poem that you'd be willing to share with us? Um, wow, sure. I'll I'll pull one up. Okay. So this is a good one for you. Um, it's all about that breakage I, I spoke about. It's called Growing Up with Judeo-Arabic. Do not take the dash away. I need to keep the, this beat steady and strong. Everything depends on this thin line connecting dreams and disbelief because it's the high note of my grandfather's Passover chant. It's the panhandle of thanks for saving my life in the Farhood. It's the pressure of a friend's palm indented with a premature goodbye. It's the praying bones of Ezra the scribe left unguarded. It's the bridge of return to the backyard fig tree I want to climb. It's the seed I want to replant. My hand crossing the border of what could be. I know I don't remember, but just because words are broken doesn't mean they're not here. Oh my gosh. That's just so powerful with uh, connections to geography and migration and trauma and language loss. And yeah. the fact that it's written in English is 
very symbolic. Yes, yes. It's like, it's all about that dash between Judeo and Arabic. You can write it without the dash, but if you take that dash away of Judeo Arabic, there's something just lost for me. I want it connected. Don't take away that connection because it feels like you're taking away the last bridge to Iraq for the Jews. And maybe that bridge has to be broken. I don't know. That's what, why they didn't pass it on. They were so hurt by their displacement. It's something not spoken about. It was, it's, it, sometimes it makes me sad how gracefully we accept tragedy of displacement and losing our whole world. Um, silence does that. You, I don't know, what we've been through, just the Iraqi Jews is, is very hard. Um, what my grandparents went through, what my father went through, and yet you'd never guess when you meet them because that's not who they were. That's not what they identified themselves by. They built the new world. And um, I think that resilience is maybe the way to, to paint their, their portraits with, rather than what happened to them, it's, it's how they responded. And that I'm proud of, and that's something else I want to always hold. And that's something I always say about Charles Bengal. And also this is not a chance, it's about resilience. It's about uh, being proud and not forgetting where we come from, but being okay and saying we're, we're, we're better now. Um, and I wonder what role heritage words can play in that resilience and that um, staking out of pride. Right. I think it's interesting because even now as I'm speaking, I'm thinking what is the importance of going back? My, my poetry book is actually called This is Why We Don't Look Back because I feel that was the message from my grandparents, from my parents is don't look back, but I can't help but look back. And I think the reason is because I wanna belong somewhere and understand where I come from. So heritage words help root us back to where we come from, but remind us that where we are today is because of where we come from, but also because of a lot of resilience in overcoming this, this displacement. So if the heritage word can remind us we come from a long line of Babylonian Jews who were exiled in 586 BCE and then again exiled in 70 CE by the Romans and we survived as Jews and kept our heritage and not only kept our heritage but created a vibrant communities with a lot of deep stories and parables and wonderful ways of holding family together. If we can hold that through our words, then we know what are we doing for our future? What families do we want to build? The importance of family, it's such a huge Middle Eastern value I grew up with, is the importance of family and um, love in the home and, and um, consistency and the idea of Shabbat every week and inviting guests and having full homes full of song and children and laughter. It's very much, that's the Iraqi Jewish ideal. So if I can pass that on to my children, with some words, then then I've done a good job, then that's worth keeping and preserving. Wow, that is exactly what we're trying to do here with this podcast, and to uh, preserve words, but also to teach the world about the diversity of the Jewish world, and the fact that we have so much in common, and yet we also have so much that's different between communities. Um, and so I, I thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing, and we'll be happy to uh, promote any of your work, uh, especially ones that are related to Judeo-Arabic. Um, so uh, thank you, Sarah Sassoon, so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.